John 8. We're looking at verse 58 today. <clears throat> In a series called Truly, Truly, I Say Unto You, John, of course, <clears throat> really brought this new teaching technique of Christ out in his writing of, of what we call the Gospel of John or St. John. I, I refer to it as the Book of John. And he's been in a, this uh, verse 58 is the third uh, truly truly is in the eighth chapter. In the eighth chapter, so we're looking at 58. And, and, and this is a very famous line that Christ spoke. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Or maybe your Bible, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And that may not, it's based on all the stuff that he's been saying in chapter 8 when he finally comes out and just lays that information on him. But listen, their reaction, they understood what he said, whether, whether we do or not. Because when he got through saying that, they pick up stones. Look at verse 59. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. When he said, before Abraham was, I am, they knew exactly how he, who he compared himself to. Uh, they were very familiar with everything Moses believed, right? They were the champions of Moses. They believed everything Moses said. And, of course, that's a great line from Exodus 3, 14 and 15. And so when he declared himself that way, Before we have a study, let's look at Moses a minute. Let's look at Exodus. Just go to Exodus, Genesis, Exodus. Third chapter, just so we get it. This is a burning bush deal. You're familiar with that, where he gets commissioned. This is his ordinational moment. He gets commissioned to ministry. Uh, within Israel as a refuge, a criminal, all the post offices in Egypt carry his picture. And we're at the burning bush, and he gets commissioned, uh, 1415. Uh, prior to that, the Lord says, I want you to go into Egypt. I want you to deliver my people. I want you to bring them out. And we call it the famous Exodus. In verse 14, I mean, if prior to that, he, he complains about to God about why he chose him. And then he says, the, the, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now watch this. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am. Did you see what he just said? I am has sent me to you. Now Jesus through this whole book, chapter 1, truly, truly, chapter 3, truly, truly, chapter 5, truly, truly, chapter 6, truly, truly, chapter 8, truly, truly. We've been studying them all. He's been telling them, that I've been sent by my Father to do His will. I mean, He has pounded that subject matter. These Israelites aren't getting it. So He makes a reference to this famous line, well known in, in Israel, this famous line that put Moses into Egypt and brought the people out. And the fa famous line... The theology is, I am who I am. Now, in the Hebrew, uh, wait, I got to have a word of prayer, so I, let me just introduce this. 
My, I could, I was about, my engine was starting to get revved up here. <clears throat> what he said is, I am who I am, and, and, and thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, now listen, I am who sent you. It's exactly what Jesus said. Exactly. Exactly what he said. All right? That's the background. And they got it. Listen, they would have been discontent if he had compared himself to Moses, let alone God. But he compared himself to God. And they picked up stones because you can't do that. You're a mere man. Now, a lot of people believe that. There was a time in my life when I believed Jesus, once I found out he was a real person and not a swear word, that I believe that. A mere man? How do how do I how can I how can I ever figure if he was a real man? A mere man is he died. Mere men die. Of course, I didn't read the other two chapters until later, and I discovered, oh, he was raised from the dead. No mere man there. But if a man dies, he's a mere man. God never dies. They believe that. So they picked up stones because they see Jesus as a mere man. I bet you if I throw this rock at you and hit you good, you'll bleed. And if I throw a bunch of them, you'll die because we believe you're a mere man. You are cer certainly not God. There's the argument. After a word of prayer, we're going to discuss this. We're going to, because when he said, I am, he just placed himself in pre-existence. Jesus just placed himself before the foundation of the world. He existed in eternity past. In fact, even the word pass, he's beyond that. Because in God... In the true identity of deity, there is no past, present, future. All that falls under sovereignty. Father, we're so thankful today for these come our way. We pray, Father, that we, as believers, approach this hour under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How would I know that? Is there personal sin in my life? If there is, there's awareness of it. The Holy Spirit has been grieved and quenched. Conviction is in my heart about sin. The issue is, have I confessed it? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Why is that important? Because the indwelling Holy Spirit has been put out of commission. He's still resident, but not in that capacity of premier resident. And so when we confess that, we're restored to fellowship the, the work of sanctificational work of the Holy Spirit in our life, and that's essential in Bible study. Spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Encourage our hearts today, Father, as we look at who the true nature of Jesus Christ is. Who does he declare, declare himself in his hap, hypostatic union? What does he declare about hypostatic union, undiminished deity and true humanity and one human being? What does he clear, declare today? Identity with deity in preexistence. Pray, Father, we might see this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, he certainly has done this in our study. Uh, when he says uh, in our text, 858, uh, Abraham was, I am, before Abraham, before, he uses it, uh, an, what we call an unusual preposition. It's a preposition that's not normally, this is what's called a rare preposition. It's used often, but not a lot. And when it is used, it, you highlight it. It's, it, and I wrote it on your paper, P-R-I-N. It's a rare preposition, uh, and it, it stands out. It, it, it points to a it's a preposition of time, place uh, in, in history. 
Before Abraham was, the word is genomai. That's not the typical word. The typical word for was is Imi. Imi is saved for the word I am when he uses the word M, I am, am, A M. It is Imi, present active indicative. When he uses genomai, it means before Abraham came into historical existence, I, d I, I existed. And the word before means before when. Okay, L let me tell you why prim is important. He, s he just said before Abraham came into historical existence, I existed. But the word prim requires you to ask, well, then when? If it wasn't Abraham, was it Adam? Where? How far back? Before Abraham, but how far back? And that's our subject today. How far back can, we, can he go when he says before Abraham came into historical existence, I existed, and let me show you the difference. When he said Abraham, he put the aorist tense as a point in historical time. When he put I am, and I am existed, right? And Prim says, if you're interested, run it as far back as you can get. Well, listen, when we run it as far as back and we get it, you're going to find that he existed before the foundation of the world. In fact, he was present at the creation of the world. So how far back can you go? We, Listen, he's going to declare himself to be equal with God today, which puts him into eternity. There is no point. And so when it comes, when he says Abraham uh, was, he puts it in the aorist tense. When he puts it I am, he puts it in the present tense and then forces you to go back and look how far that is. It is the present tense of eternity. <laughs> puts you back into, how, how do we explain that? I don't know. I mean, where did God come from? That'd be one of those. Listen, when you get to heaven, a light bulb will go off. As soon as you step into heaven, you'll go like ding, ding. I wonder how come I how come I couldn't see that. Where did God come from? It's gonna like it's, it's gonna go like ding, ding. So you might as well have that ding ding moment now. This can't be explained on this side. So, John the Baptist, the Gospel of John, the Book of John, identifies John the Baptist. He, John the Baptist, is six months older, according to Luke's account. Six months older. We, we all know that. Six. Most of us won't be a gate question because. Too many people know it. Six months older than Jesus. So this is interesting what John says. See, John's, John, John is writing the theology. The book of John is writing the theology of the preexistence of Jesus Christ. He's showing the deity of this man called Jesus Christ. This is the, this is the book of John. All right. Now, look, look, in John 1.15, he records, John records John the Baptist preaching. This was he about Christ. He, John says, and everybody knew in the church by now, that John the Baptist was the forerunner, like, like Malachi preached, the forerunner of the Messiah to declare to Israel. Everybody knew that John the Baptist was a prophet. Now, they didn't know for sure who Jesus was. They were all over the place with who he was. But everybody, everybody, but everybody, everybody's brother knew this about John the Baptist. He was a prophet and the prophet of the Messiah. Everybody knew that. Now, he records John saying this. This was he of whom I said, th talking about Jesus of Nazareth, this is the guy who I've been preaching to you about. He who comes after me has higher rank than I, watch this, for he existed before me. <clears throat> he, 
He was in existence before John came into existence. Yet, by their birth date, John's older. See what he's teaching? He's teaching the same thing as before Abraham was. I am. He was teaching the same thing. And John has picked this up because this is one of the great subjects of the book of John. This is one of the great subjects of the book of John. John is a theologian on the person and identity of Jesus Christ. So, when we come to our subject matter, we're going to look at four things today if we could get there. We're going to look at the pre-existence of Christ. Now, if you want to really get a, where you know John is going to take you, you go to the first chapter of John, read the first 18 verses. I don't know if I put that on your paper, but if you want to know where he's going with the, with the story of Jesus Christ and hang him on a cross and raise him from the dead... This is where, he, this is the theology of the book of John is recorded. He's going to take you on a journey after you read the first 18 verses. And it's the preexistence of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about an eternity past. Okay? In John the fourth, here's point number one. The book of John is known for Jesus declaring his preexistence as Christ as the eternal son of God. For example, in John, the 14th chapter, 8 through 12, where John records, there is this stated. Jesus says, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I don't know. Can you have identical twins from a father to a son? <laughs> That's what he just said. You could get us mixed up. Think about that. I'm not talking about close to comparison. You know, my son Bill and I will be out, and people will go like, boy, you guys... I said, yeah, that's my, that's my father. We're not identical twins. Jesus did, listen, Jesus declared that he and the father are identical. If you've seen me, you have seen the father. Wow. They went out and hunted for stones that day. These guys, I tell you, they were all rock explorers, weren't they? Jesus Christ got all these people into all kinds of rock. They knew more about rocks when he left this earth than they ever did. Listen, he goes on to say, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And you know what he means by this? He means I'm 100% in the Father, and the Father is 100% in me. <laughs> so that if you see the fa if you see me, you see the Father. You, you can see the Father. He couldn't say, if you see the Father, you see me. You'll learn that when you get to heaven. It'll be one of those light bulbs. Now, in John 8, 58, you have a reference Bible. I'm sure they've re referenced you to Exodus, the third chapter, 14 and 15, haven't they? Well, if it didn't, I'd write it in there. <laughs> because that's exactly. And in the Hebrew, you have Hayah, I am, Hayah, that's I am. Who, haya? It's haya. Who, haya? I am who I am. Now the haya is the same in Hebrew as I am in the Greek. It's an absolute status vo verb, an absolute status quo verb of existence. 
It's the same. In fact, in the Greek language, they will translate, in the Septuagint, they will translate haya aimi, as they did here. They'll do it aimi. It was an absolute verb of existence, the way they described. Now, the I am and the I am, haya haya, I am who I am, haya who I am, who, haya, they're, they're cows, watch this now, they're, and I wrote this down for, I don't know if I wrote it on your paper, but they're cal imperfects, first person singulars. And, and that's just exactly, who, who, who should I, and listen to what they got. Now, I read this to you. He said, who shall I say sent me? He said, well, here it is. You, here it is for you. I am who I am. See, they were talking personally, weren't they? <laughs> Shut up. Listen, I'm good. I am who, just tell them I am who I am. But I got to, I've got to get you to believe it first, right? Oh, I know. Now, now here's where the, here's where the rubber hits the pavement. Oh, well, I get the theology, but listen. Can you get the idea in your soul of I am that I am? Because Moses has got, to, has got to get that in his soul because it is the I am who I am that every time he speaks a word to Moses, Moses got to believe that he has the character to fulfill it. Agreed? Hey, there's going to be 10. There's going to be 10 plagues as never before, and cannot be duplicated after three. You know, he comes out with the first plague, and the magicians of Egypt come along and go like, we got this one, Pharaoh. <laughs> we got it. So they do a second one. They come back to Pharaoh. We got this one, too. No sweat. This guy, is, he's a rookie. They do it. The third one, no sweat. We got it. This guy, oh, my word, this is a piece of cake. The fourth one hit them. And there was nothing they could do about it. There was nothing they could do about it except beg to get it off from them. And they went, Phew. we just got trumped. Holy catfish, we just, oh, how about the fifth one? How about the sixth one? How about the seventh one? How about the eighth one? How about the ninth one? You cry uncle, huh? Okay, what about the 10th one? Oh, please, not the 10th one. Oh, yeah, you get the 10th one too. No, please, not the 10th one. Oh, yeah, you get the 10th one. You know who did that? If you say Moses, you're wrong. But you know who believed by the time they got the 10th that that would be there? You know who believed that? Moses. When they got to the 10th one to take the firstborn, I guarantee you Moses got his kids together and had to come to Jesus' meeting. Because let me tell you, the firstborn, if it don't have the blood on the post, the firstborn is going to die. Undertakers are going like, finally, we got a day. This is our Christmas. Everybody else, this was going to be a, this is going to be a terrible day. You know who did that? I am that I am. When Moses goes in there, he's a little wobbly on this thing. Think how wobbly he was after the first one got matched. And he goes back in, he says, you know, the first time he walks in, he goes like, let my people go. The second time he walks in, he said, let my, let my people go. They match it. Third time he goes in, let my people go. Let my people go. And, you know, this is all about building him to understand that I am who I am. 
So when it comes to the people, listen to what he says in verse 15. In Exodus, he says, listen, just tell them I am. They'll tell you who I am. When I get through, they'll tell you, I am. I am. I am God Almighty. There's no other God like me on earth. I am God Almighty. See, here's the point. It's what Jesus is telling them. This is what Jesus is telling them. I am that I am. I am that I am. Because that's what God told Moses. He was the I am of the I am. Do you know what in reality he's telling them? You know, you know the power structure behind everything that went on in the exodus of the ten plagues and all of the other? You know who the I am of the I am was that did this? Da 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 da. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you. Jesus Christ. Yeah. In verse 15, the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the Lord God of your father, Isaac, the Lord God of your father, Jacob, this is my name. I am forever. You know, after he came out of the grave, even I believed. that he was a unique man of the universe, not just a mere man. John carries this same I am doctrine into the book of Revelation, the same writer. In Revelation 1.18, he refers to the I am as the Alpha and Omega, the Greek alphabet. Alpha and Omega, the first letter and the last letter of the, of the Greek alphabet. I am, and later he's going to say, I am the beginning and the end. In Revelation 1, 8 and 21, 6 and 7. I love what he says in this. We often don't read what is written, but he says, who is, who was, and who is to come? <laughs> That's our that's our 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 I am, isn't it? Who is, who was, and who is to come? Every Eucharist we declare that. John really got this picture in his in his head. They declared in John the 10th chapter that these Jews in the 10th chapter 31 through 33, they, de they declare that he is blasphemed because he's a mere man claiming to be God. John 10, 33. See, I do understand that a mere man, if, you, if he bleeds, he's a mere man. If he dies, he's certainly. So how did Christ counter that? Because he did all that, didn't he? He bled on the cross and he died on it, didn't he? Uh, because up from the grave he arose. <laughs> Happy Easter. Up from the grave he arose. And listen, ain't that true in our life? I mean, he is the, listen, he's the, he is an almighty, infinite wisdom God, and yet he has a personal relationship with each of us. Is that amazing? This God who became flesh dwells in us. That's, I mean, how, how, how good is that, people? That when we chose Christ, we were chosen and chosen for him to dwell in us and to move among us, among our people. Just being aware of that's important, don't you think? Being aware of that, especially when we're in conflict 
in our life. I mean, sometimes I see young mothers, they're just frazzled at both ends. Husbands need to be much more caregiving than they are. They think because they work eight, she's been home all, all day. I have the hardest time coaching up husbands. You're eight, listen, you stay home and let her go out work eight, day, uh, eight hours. That, that, be, that would be a rest period. <laughs> listen, my wife was smart. Saturdays was my day with the kids, and she went, quote, shopping. Shopping. I don't know how you can do that for a half a day, or, or uh, but she went, shopping. And I tell you, we were all so glad when Mama come home with whatever she came home with. We all ran out to the car. We all ran out there. We all hugged on her. We all told her, whoa, we missed you. And I was like a little kid crying the loudest. <laughs> My wife was really smart. It took me probably five, six years to figure that out. We're kind of slow, aren't we, guys? Here's the second point. So they charged him with blasphemy. They understood this. They charged him with blasphemy. In, in the second thing, I want you to see what John did. Now, if you have a good study Bible, they've already told you this. If you have a good study, if you have a Ryrie in the, in, the, in, the gossip, in the book of John, he's going to point this out to you. It's my job to make sure you get this. He's going to list seven I am's that show the preexistence declared by Jesus in addition to things like John 1.15 and John 8.58. And so I wrote these down for you just in case. But here's, and notice I said home study. I don't know when you'll get it. Maybe that's, what, that's when Jane got her quiet time. Uh, now I know why she took her Bible with her grocery list. But <clears throat> listen, so here's what I want you to do. I'm going to do the first one for you, and then home study. This will be a great home study for you. Listen, everything and everyone, I, for example, he's going to say, I am, the, I am the bread of life in John 6. He, in, in chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, I am the sheep gate. John 10, I am the good shepherd. John 11, I am the resurrection of life. John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, I am the true vine. But here's what I want you to do. You know most of these. You've heard these priests. They're the but did you know that these are declaring his preexistence? See, this, these to come from John. Here's what I want you to do. When you go and do your study this week, and this will be a good study for you, I'm telling you, find a promise to your life that's given in each one of these. There's a promise given to you. In every one of these, there's a special promise given to each one of us. Do not miss that. For example, do you realize that in John, the sixth chapter, 35, when he says, I am the bread of life, that he, this has come from John 6, which is the longest chapter in John. Listen, the chapter 6 in John is nearly twice as big as the whole book of Jonah. Think about that. This is the longest, John 6, and he gets into, this is the longest chapter of the book of John, and this passage from about, from about 6, 25 through 59, 6th chapter, is the longest messianic doctrine in the book. It's the longest messianic doctrine. This thing of I am the bread of life goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. I'll see you next week. It's a long. So what I want to do is narrow it down to give you to taste, give you a taste of what I'm after. Look at verse 35. Jot, drop back to John 6. God, I'm not going to get out of here anyhow with the whole lesson done. You guys say, don't take the doggy bag home with you, Calvin. It's a doggy bag day. 
John, the sixth chapter, look at verse 35. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Right? Look at verse 51. Now, there's more. I'm just giving you a sampling. Just wet your appetite. Wet your thirst. Wet. Well, anyhow. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. Look. Now, he's talking spiritually. Th th to hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. Right? And eternal life. And, and listen, there's more. Just hunt them out. There's promises. There's all kinds of promises. And listen, every one of these, look for what he promises you and write that down. It's a promise to you. I am the bread of life. And he's, he's talking to you. Listen, your hunger and thirst for truth, your hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God will be absolutely 100% satisfied. You eat this bread, you eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus Christ, an analogy to believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, you will live forever. And thank goodness not the way you live now. See, I have to tell people that every once in a while because sometimes you got people that are really in pain and suffering and they're racked and they go like, I wouldn't want to live forever. I've had people, I've visited people when they have told me, listen, I, I don't like that statement at all because I don't want to live like this forever. And I go like, oh. <laughs> Sometimes when you're healthy, you don't think that way. But the person is sick does. And so you kind of have to be mindful of that. We're not talking about, we're talking about, well, anyhow. I, I want you to go through that list, would you? Also, at point three, I'm just going to do this, and we're going to quit. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to go through some things to look for. All of John's I am's, all of John's I am's in the book of John, all of them, denote the eternal preexistence of Jesus Christ, listen to me, as the visible member of the Godhead. The visible that's when he says, man, this is an enormous statement. When he says, if, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, because he's the visible manifestation of, of the deity of God in human form. You know, in the Old Testament, if you did that, you died. Well, yeah. In John 17, 5 and 24, and now glorify thou me together with thyself, Father, with the, and uh, Tony hit this, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. See, that's the power of that upper room discourse. He is the image of the invisible God. And listen, watch this one. Watch this one. When you read 1 Timothy 3.16, look for the six clues to the mystery of godliness because he outlines them. There is an enormous study there. There's a whole study there. The mystery of godliness is described by six clues. Um, oh, here's another one. Be, pay attention to Matthew 123 and Luke 122 with Jesus' I am in the incarnation of Emmanuel. People say, well, you know, he said he was, he, he, he called him Emmanuel. Nobody ever called him Emmanuel. No, he was the visible manifestation. Emmanuel is the visible manifestation of the deity of God in the incarnation. They got to see a lot of that. And then finally, uh, when you study, pay attention to the embodiment in Jesus Christ. Embodied in Jesus Christ dwells, watch this now, the total existence, essence of undiminished deity and true humanity. I mean, most people, I mean, just to pull the true humanity out and say, Absolutely 100% right on the money. Perfect man. Would that not be something? I mean, who could even do that? 
But listen, to do the same thing with deity in that humanity, to be able to say this humanity is 100% true humanity, and to turn around and say, and that same humanity is 100% deity, see how difficult that is? Theologically, we call that hypostatic union. And point four is dealing with that subject matter, like in Colossians 2, 9, and 10, Colossians 3, 3. The, the, you know, I thought this was interesting, these Jews with Pilate. In 19th chapter of John, in verse 15, Pilate says, Shall I, and he struggled with it, Shall I crucify your king? The Jews responded, We have no king but Caesar. Boy, will they eat those words. Will they ever eat those words? I have no other king. I have no other king. Titus, Titus, I don't think this is on your paper. It might be worth writing that. But Titus 2.13, the blessed hope the of the glorious appearance, appearance, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. Listen to how he describes it. Of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, anyhow, it's well worth your read, people. Well worth your read on the rest of that, but I've ran out of time. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. We'll have a word of prayer. We'll do the salute, then we'll be dismissed. Okay? Father, we are so thankful for these who have come our way today, both by automobile and by internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this word, and I, I pray for those who are visiting with us, both by automobile and internet, would, would take this subject matter and study, even though I ran out of time. Uh, we recorded every bit of it on paper uh, and laid it out into a form of reading and understanding. I pray that be true. I pray that uh, this is a great subject matter, an entire... Well, I mean, it is the subject of John's great writing next to Paul. He is the top, not top writer. I mean, John, the three Johns, Revelation. So we need to take that book serious. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.